there's a conflict between what my father literally specifically is professing to believe and teach and then he's doing some things that at least conflict with that we don't talk about it so it's not like he's clearly saying sexually touching your daughters is wrong i'm doing it but you know that what's happening over here cannot be called pure there were so many other hypocrisies and conflicts the way that we would present ourselves all the way up to being on tv versus what really happened yeah. you know behind closed doors and getting in trouble for doing anything that would break that outward testimony and we were going further and further from that we were no longer going to church we had this home church when needed it was well god's will why are we doing tv well it's god's will really or is it just dad's will <laughs> yeah Welcome back to the Preacher Voice Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Swarzynski, and I'm holding in my hands one of the most powerful memoirs that I have ever read. One of the most beautiful things about the Preacher Voice Podcast is I get to hear so many different survivors' stories and occasionally get to read them in a book format and spend a lot of time in their shoes hearing their story and getting to understand the process of Yes, the abuse and trauma, but also the journey of healing that they have been on. And Jessica's story is incredible. There's a link in my show notes to pick up a copy of the book. Do that right now so you don't forget. There's an audio book. There's a paperback and hardcover. But whatever format you read it in, it is going to be worth your time. Jessica Willis Fisher grew up in the Willis family, a large conservative family that became really well known for their musical abilities. It landed them appearances on The Today Show and America's Got Talent and even a season of a reality show on TLC. But beneath the veneer of the loving, happy family, there was a lot of abuse happening at the hands of Toby Willis, Jessica's father. He's now in prison serving multiple sentences, and Jessica joined me on the show today to talk a little bit about her story, the healing process, and what it's looked like expressing this story in such a public format. I really appreciate this conversation. I could have spoken with Jessica for honestly hours more. And I think as a listener, you're going to feel the same way. You're going to want to hear more and more from her. So pick up a copy of Unspeakable wherever you get your books. And I hope this conversation is an encouragement to you. If you are a survivor or someone looking to support survivors, uh, there's something in this for everybody. And I really appreciate Jessica taking the time to join me on today's show. So let's go ahead and get in my conversation with Jessica Willis Fisher. Jessica, thank you so much for joining me on today's show. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, it's been a long time in the making. You sent over a copy of your book a couple months ago, and I took uh, time to read through it. And yeah, I'm glad we finally got some on the calendar and we're able to connect. And there's so much to talk about. So right off the bat, I'm going to tell anybody listening, grab a copy of Jessica's book. Um, It is really phenomenal. And one of the best things about the podcast is I've gotten to read so many different perspectives and different authors and get to read people's stories. And it can be a heavy thing, but I think it's an important thing um, that people should should do and take the time to, to really hear. At the beginning of the book, you talk about the reasons you chose to write the book. And your top three were to clear the record, um, to bring an end to shame and silence, and ultimately to help educate people about abuse and how to better equip survivors. But I have to ask, when you first put pen to paper, you know what what were you feeling? Did you feel like I'm quote unquote ready to share my story, or was it just a uh, let's figure this out as we go along? First off, let me back up and just say thank you for reading the book. You know, it's yeah. never. Um, it, it, it ends up being, I think, a very personal thing for people because I'm sharing something personal and then right. people's reactions to it usually has to do with whether they've encountered this topic mm-hmm. before, if they've had an experience and how they've chosen to handle that. Um, so I know it's not the easiest thing to get through. And I always am grateful when people have the capacity and make the choice to go ahead and look and hold space for that. So thank you for that. And then, yeah, I did fairly early in the book, just kind of wanted to state some of my intentions. And to my recollection, there's kind of why a lot of reasons why I wrote the book. And to me, those were the top reasons to share it, to Hmm. publish it. Because I do think that a lot of those things, there's a lot of overlap, but there are a lot of things that could be accomplished, just me writing it and never publicly sharing it. So to me, acknowledging 
the extra challenge of making something public for anyone to choose to read or listen to, um, you know, was a whole new level of vulnerability, um, being open to critique and opinion and all of these things. Yeah. I felt like there were a lot of possible positives that made that worth it. As far as starting to just write it, I was not thinking of sharing it with other people. Um, I certainly um, have part of my story has been that my literal voice and kind of persona and storytelling has was a part of a family band was a part of mm. being on TV and and there were so many stories told that I from at least myself first um, living in my own mind my own skin had to address the gap but you know the lies yeah. that I had been a part of that I had told. And there were things that I needed clarity on. What was it that really happened? You know, I needed to acquire a vocabulary. So essentially the writing just started as therapy before I knew what therapy was, mm -hmm. right? Even going back into my childhood, journaling, um, writing songs, trying to express, trying to make sense of what I was going through. Um, you know, really confusing experiences that no one was able to help me process or help me articulate. Mm -hmm. um, and so in a lot of ways, I kind of look back and I do think I genuinely love art and writing and all of that. And I do kind of have to leave room for, <laughs> I have no idea how much I would have been drawn to these things if I hadn't had experiences that literally prior, right at the beginning, and or prior to my my memory making, these things were there right from the beginning. And so I think I I was drawn to what my mind made sense of maybe this is a tool to help me make sense and survive. And so the book was just born out of the 30 year continuance of, yeah. of those things. Um, and some of it was, you know, homework that my, you know, or, or challenges that my therapist would give me. And some of it was just me, um, again, kind of continuing on a habit of, say, journaling. Yeah. Um, but it was really powerful to start to, there was, there's something about either saying it aloud to someone, putting it down on paper that helps um, answer the question of, did I make this up? Will anyone believe me? What is it that happened? You start to kind of um, make a lot of progress. Um, at least that was my experience intertwined with uh, your earliest memories is mm -hmm. these creative outlets and you you were in a family that was extremely creative and i think going through something where, where there's so much bad toxicity wrapped up mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. i have to imagine it puts you off for a second of like do i even like playing music do i even like doing this thing do i is this me is this them um and obviously it can taint your view of some of those memories did it affect how you viewed yourself? Like, was there this reckoning period of like, do I even want to be in the music industry? Do I even want to be writing and expressing myself creatively? Or was that always just, that's inseparable from who I am? Um, great question. Love that question. I would say, yeah, I've been on a journey with that in, in particular. Um, I do talk about it some in the book, I think. Um I guess I'll skip to maybe in 2018, I had the great privilege um, to attend a experiential therapy retreat mm. um, called Onsite Workshops. And they had this, that you go through a lot of things. You do essentially what's like a year's worth of trauma therapy in a week. And I had just done a year's worth of trauma therapy and I can pretty much say, yep, that was different, but mm. equivalent. I guess in some ways. And they had this one little kind of like exercise thing where they were looking at like medicators, hmm. not as in just medication that may be hmm. overprescribed or very necessary or just, you know, um, but medicators as in anything that we do to kind of maybe self medicate and distract you know, deal with a symptom versus what's really going on for us emotionally, psychologically. Um, and the weird thing is kind of anything can be used that way. Um, exercise, which everybody pretty knows, pretty much knows is necessary and healthy when done in a way that's, you know, moderated, but can be taken to such an obsessive, yeah. destructive level, addictive level. Um, 
sex, um, the different hobbies and interests that we have, certainly work, workaholism, you know, like we come up with these terms of, hey, this thing by itself isn't morally good or bad, but how are we using it? Right. And certainly music and art um, can be something that maybe goes to a dark place or goes overboard. And at that time, when I was at this retreat, I was trying to separate out. I had music that felt, at least at certain periods, very core to who I was, you know, and certainly was part of the image of how the world maybe saw me when it was seeing me. Um, and then a crisis of this is so tangled up. How do I know this isn't part of the problem? Oh, yeah. uh, stepping away. And I was wanting to come back and and answer this question for myself. And so I remember talking to my group leader and being like, I'm trying to figure out, like, is this particular thing right. net positive or or positive or negative for me? And she said, this is a shortcut, but feel free to sometimes use this little tool. Like this thing, whatever it is, am I using it to connect, express, feel, tell the truth, right? Mm. Or am I using this thing to numb, disconnect, no. distract? Um, distract, I think, is a key one for me because there are things that I examine still to this day and go, mm, this is a that I quickly turn to for distraction. Um, and that's fine at times. We do what we need to to get through a moment. But I did get this clarity of, you know, music always for me was a way to try to make sense of things, to process, to and, and realizing that, oh, that means instead of being a medicator, it's literally a therapy. It's something right. that we use. Hopefully, therapy doesn't just mean trying to find someone who can give you good expert care and you pay them and, it, you know, it's this own separate thing therapeutically like we have to find a sustainable way to between friends community family our daily habits our you know mental and emotional nutrition so to speak you know we have to figure out a way to live healthily and for me you know music has been very much kind of reclaimed um it was something that was taken advantage of a beautiful thing that was used and that's you know a wound um but when i get to use and integrate music in kind of what feels like my second life, right. it's really empowering um, and freeing, and yeah. it feels right. The book really is so in depth and feels so personal, and it does feel like a journal. Like at times, you're like you you feel like you're really spending time in your shoes throughout the book, which I think is probably the highest praise for a book like this. Is it it makes you really empathize Thank with you. those experiences? And I know you've done a lot of interviews and conversations and. So many, I think, dive into the reality show and the kind of the things that were publicly out there. Um, but I know there's a religious undercurrent to your story that is really present. I mean, from the very beginning, you mentioned your mom met your dad. He was at Pensacola Christian College. Um, was, you know, yeah. um, how entrenched in that world was he? And I know that by the time things were at a, a boiling point, he was very much his own brand of religion at that point. But growing up, like what was your religious kind of context, you know, in that, sure. in that point? Yeah. So you've read the book. I mean, I have lived the story that I'm telling and like just the summary being, yeah, there were these years where maybe someone knows something about my story because they know about these like three or four years that were public. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really a small part in the whole story that for me has been going on for 30 plus years at this point. Um, and, you know, prior to those years, which included big family band on TV, lots of kind of chaos and stuff going on. And people were just kind of watching this, you know, it was a TLC show, yeah. kind of exactly what you would imagine. Prior to that, you know, I, it's weird to think about, um, lots of people have families that might have siblings. I <laughs> was in a family that had just initially two kids, <laughs> and then three, and then four, right? Wow. So I had this experience that was so different from what it eventually started as. And then if you ask me, and I describe in the book, you know, life was built around doing school at home with mom, who literally studied teaching. Um, my dad was working a nine to five job in the city. We lived in Chicago. We had this little tiny place and we went to church. Grandpa was the pastor. You know, those were 
I played with my siblings. Like there's really nothing more to report, right? right. <laughs> it's pretty um, normal, you know, um, and it's not until we start adding this strange fact and this strange fact and then sure. combine them all that we get to a really kind of extreme place, extreme good, extreme bad. Um, and, you know, as far as the religion goes, I am doing a lot of reflecting now, a lot of my current work um, mm -hmm. that I'm feeling drawn to at the same time, paddling like hell to get away from <laughs> at the same time, <laughs> a lot of expenditure of energy and, and everything um, and emotional. Uh, I'm very much still trying to put the pieces together, but what I can kind of narrate and have processed through now is not just what it looks like to me in my 30s, but what was it that my child self saw and experienced? Mm -hmm. And how did that form the react? You know, it's the princess and the pea thing, right? There's like 30 mattresses stacked on top, but like, let's go back to level one, level mm -hmm. two, and like try to understand what that experience was like. And then at some point you're adding the reflection now and maybe redoing those foundations. So yeah. that's an overview. But, you know, for me, church um, was very patriarchal, literally. <laughs> you know, my dad participated in the church a lot. He would um, run, I think, what we would call children's church um, during the sermon. And we would, you know, he had little children, so we would go downstairs. I'd be with the other little kids. Um, we He would play piano and or sing um, with other members of my extended family, sometimes with us, um, but we were really little at that point. Um, and grandpa was the pastor. Um, my grandpa baptized me. My grandpa, you know, was um, definitely a very, you know, visual and emotional um, and literal stand-in for what I was being told the the allegory and the you know figures of speech the 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 similes and the metaphors of you know god as a man god mm -hmm. as a patriarchal older what you know you know he's the got stereotype the stereotype of hands yeah. you know and I, and i saw how little my hand was compared to my dad's very large hand you know and i saw um protection and authority and all of those things. And I was being told the Bible stories and told that those were the takeaways that I was supposed to be taking. And then I was seeing it mm -hmm. very literally in my life. I wasn't the kid that was like, God's the father, but I don't have a father. What does that mean? Yeah, right. so I was very much. Um, and I think that's why, you know, if you're gonna pick some sort of metaphor, you're picking one that most people have some sort of example for good or for bad. Um, and, you know, I think there definitely was, I have a memory of not being afraid of my dad, of truly loving him and, and my grandpa and my mom and, you know, my family that was literal, but also we very much were told like your church family mm -hmm. is, you know, anyone that believes the way that we do, even if they're not alive anymore, you know? And um, I think that was another big thing is as a child, the other thing that stands out to me as part of my story, but also the religious interpretation of it is that there was, you know, in evangelical Christianity, you talk about your testimony mm -hmm. and my extended family had this testimony pretty much by the time I can form these memories, it was happening right around then. My dad had these siblings that had died in a car accident and my grandparents had survived. And, you know, there were these headlines of minister and his wife mm. kind of, you know, still believe in God and praise God and trust God, even though they just had six children die. Um, and that was something that kind of spread. There was this moment um, and a few follow-up moments over the years where, you know, their testimony was something that really did kind of go around the world. Yeah. Um, and now I'm another child in this extended family. And even though I'm three and a half and four and five, I know that just because you're a child doesn't mean that your life can't end at any mm. moment. <laughs> yeah. And so even the idea of where are you going to go when you die? You know, that was something that would be on the little gospel tracks or you would get asked or it would come up in a sermon. And it was this like, 
you're a child, but you already are understanding like this is a test. This is a question to make you think and to, I mean, I think fear, you know, like what if you're going to die and go to hell? And that was not necessarily a totally theoretical thing for me as I had just seen this happen. It was like, well, if you want to be with them one day in heaven, um, we can all be there together and whatever suffering and hardship and, you know, sin there is here, there's something ahead that we can, you know, our faith has the answer to how to make sense of the things that are really kind of never going to make sense in life. And so I, um, like asked Jesus to be my savior when I was definitely younger than seven or definitely younger than eight, um, probably seven, six, seven, somewhere in there. Um, yeah. And it was just, I'm participating in this thing that are, it's like the cornerstone of our family's life really. Right. It is interesting because I've been thinking through that for the last year or so. It's fascinating, like how early on you're faced with mortality within fundamentalist religious circles, because like you said, every track is, if you were to die today, are you a hundred percent sure you'd go to heaven every time there's a funeral, which in the church that I grew up in, it was like a lot of 70 plus people. So like you were at funerals a lot and it was, you're going to see them one day. Are you going to, you know, are you going to every, Mm -hmm. everything was laced with those kind of questions. And then on top of that, you're being told about this theistic figure that like you, um, it's really interesting. You brought up the patriarchal kind of view because I'm reading Reza Aslan's book, God, right now. Um, and this is not an endorsement of him because I don't know enough about him to go any which way. But in the book, he says, like, if you ask almost any child, their first view of God is their father. And um, I'm I'm kind of curious, most of the people that I talk to, there's like the happy memories, and then there's like the turning point, you know? And for you in your book, you mentioned like, three earliest memories when you go back it's like two that are like general cute stories that everyone kind of Random. <laughs> you're you're literally i'm reading the book kind of smiling you know cuz i've i've got a kid like these are relatable funny you know kind of cute stories and then you get to the third story and it's a story of abuse and growing up without having even a chance to develop a sense of what's normal and what's not when did it pivot to where you go, something is wrong, you know? Because yeah. I, I I know, you know, you say in the book, like, you knew something was weird, but like, mm-hmm. when did it shift from that to like, oh, this, this is really yeah. not normal? So a couple things. So yes, I talk about this early memory and instead of phrasing it as an abusive memory as you're reading it, I really wanted to explain and try to articulate the challenge of trying to articulate that. Uh, I look at it now and say, this is abuse. I don't even know if this is the first time it happened. Here's how it fits in a pattern of grooming in a pattern, you know, and there's all of that, but the experience of it, I'm four, you know, or yeah. three something literally. These are just those so far back memories that there's only three or four for that whole year, right? Like yeah. time hasn't really kicked in in my memory. Right. Um, and for me, although I know that was an abusive moment, it was not traumatic for me in the moment. I remember being confused and feeling like there was something I didn't under, you know, as children, it's a daily multiple times per day we taste a food we've never known we hear a word we don't know what it means and so we're constantly asking why what you know and the adults all day long to their great sometimes (laughs) annoyance or loss of just patience or distraction like hey you know that means this or don't do that or you know here's a lesson i have to teach you And I remember feeling that urge of like, I don't know exactly what just happened. I feel like I should ask a question, but I don't even know. Mm. I don't have the words to ask about what it was that just happened. And so I had experience with my dad where he was touching me. And the next time I saw my mom right after, I was just kind of like, what, what do I say? And, um, you know, that I would say is kind of a description of a lot of the stuff that probably would have 
that happened um, until I was around eight or nine. And the first time I talk about in the book going, hey, something's wrong, it was not necessarily something that was done to me. And I went, whoa, that was wrong. That was weird. Yes, I was confused. I didn't have the words to articulate what had just happened, but I was not afraid. I was not in pain. Right. So I didn't have these red flags, so to speak. It was just, hey, TBD, don't know exactly what that is. At some point, there's this trust and this innocence of, I'll figure it out. Someone mm -hmm. will explain it to me. I'll encounter the information and go, ah, right. But the first time I was like, something is wrong was watching my parents interact mm -hmm. and seeing that my mom was like afraid and upset for my dad to come home from work one day. And it may have happened before. I just remember the dawning of like, maybe that slight loss of innocence or at least introduction of worry or anxiety or, hey, something's wrong here. It was like, mom takes care of me. Mom takes care of dad. This is how the whole system works. And then wait a second, what happens when mommy is crying and there's no one to care for her, process, wrap their arms around her and feeling drawn to like, oh no, when you're confronted with this, there's this gap and you have even at a very young age at least i had this urge to like step into that gap and try to serve this role but you cannot as a tiny child right. really be a caretaker to your caretaker right. and there's fear because what if this caretaker isn't able to care for me so mm. and then you're like does that make me selfish like you're just trying to figure out all these things that are very much above your head and so there was that that, you know, I was like, mom's the only other person I could ask about this, but she seems like she's got her stuff that I don't understand. And so it all just keeps adding up to confusion and a sense of gradually thinking there, there is more and more here that's not right, but I just don't understand what it is. Hmm. Um, and then we were living in Tennessee, uh, or we were living in Chicago until I was around eight or nine. And then we moved right before my ninth birthday. And, um, in a nutshell, the accident led to a wrongful um, a settlement. Um, that part of that money came to my dad. He retired from his work, and we moved to Tennessee in this really big house. There's more to it, but right. um, that's a story. And it was there that we were no longer in that same church around those same people. There was a lot that was wonderful. Imagine for little Christian kids, like moving to Narnia, right? Right. Yeah. Moving to the house in the country, right? And like, literally, are we going to walk around the corner and there's a wardrobe? Like, that's what it, that's what it really felt like. And understanding now that we were, um, like many people when they move, um, or children, you know, you lose some of the foundation that you've had up until that time. Um, isolated really, really for the first really time. Did, right. And my dad really took it far over the years in the direction of isolation but initially it's all fun right it's all it's all just I, fantasy really do you uh, when we moved dad dad did something different that was overwhelming in my body i felt fear and it was the first instance of abuse that was traumatic in the moment hmm. and one of the byproducts of that was every other like sexual touching incident all connected and made sense in my mind that all of this was predatory wrong and i didn't and i could see it escalating and i didn't i started to not want <laughs> that to happen and to kind of feel you know if i'm around that like everything just kind of shifted in right. that but it took a while i mean it was years sure. of stuff where i even was realizing that something was that wrong and it was my body that told me that yeah and already i feel like the foundation was laid to not trust one's body right and be disconnected from it and so the dissociation really kicked in as a survival mechanism do you think that initial move do you think he saw an opportunity to begin that isolation or do you think he saw that as a bonus to a situation that he was already benefiting from you know i have definitely spent time trying to, for lack of a better word, get inside my dad's head, but also who would want to get inside my dad's right. head. You know, and no kind of normal scary. person's going to ever understand the mindset. It's kind of like trying to make sense of serial killers and like, you know, okay, I already know this is kind of a scary thing or a confusing thing. Um, and I do think it's hard because if someone were to even just ask my dad, like, 
you have an unreliable narrator issue. Yep. I think, how would you ever even know? Um, so I've come to the point where like, we'll never know many, many things, but I certainly can look at the pattern and kind of discern different things. And from what I can tell, you know, dad talked to me from a very early age. I was very convinced for long stretches of time that like I was his favorite child. Right. And definitely when we were in periods of the most typical kind of grooming that was really turned up to 10, you know, you're special here, you know, just um, even within a family to isolate a child and create distance of, you know, us versus them. And that definitely went on. Um, but dad would tell me about different dreams and ideas and the way that he saw the world to the point where he would say, this is the way the world is and I'm teaching you. And there was that element with the abuse. Um, I'm teaching you this. We're doing this. Here's how to kind of justify it and think about it. Um, and a lot of just really inappropriate harmful indoctrinating things there, but even just the idea of community or mm -hmm. philosophy or education. Um, you know, he had a lot of these ideas in his head. And I think when you're working a nine to five, lip, raising kids, having to pay for them, um, pay you know, to support the family, again, the system that was ideal, that God had ordained was the father is the leader, the provider, the protector, the mother is kind of the the help meet literally, you know, and is in submission and service to what the man of God is being led towards and everything. And then the children are to obey both and, you know, kind of be under the purview of the woman for care and everything. Um, and it doesn't mean that there weren't a lot of other dreams and aspirations, I think, in his head. Sure. From things he literally told me. Um, but it's a totally different thing to get like a $10 million check. No. Because no matter what your grand ideas are, reality kind of curbs those. And I think there is a total change in opportunity, you know, yeah. when you look at even sexual abuse and you look at the opportunity angle, um, you know, or access or supply and things like that. And like my dad's supply, so to speak, totally changed at that yeah. point because now he's able to be home, right? So literally as far as him having access to me and his children in general totally changed um his ability to kind of not need and depend on other people in the community he could just pay someone to do to right. do some um he managed finances very badly um and he tried to kind of run this business and it didn't work um after a number of years so that only lasted for a certain amount of time but um, it was kind of, I think of, I thought of them, especially in my childhood, as these like golden years. Because again, I had siblings that were born into that, right? They almost right. had a different initial family. Right. But I was like, yeah, there were five kids in one room in the city versus 182 acres and horses, Jeez. right? <laughs> it was just yeah. like drastically, drastically different. But I think that uh, it was mainly opportunity in my mind. Um, and we also had a theological way to frame that. Right. Like, it's a blessing, right? And yeah. like, who are we to kind of question that, right? right. Well, um, and there's been tragedy, and now there's blessing. Yeah. You know? Well, so many are taught like the quiverful kind of lifestyle, and have as many kids as you can, and do. And for many in fundamental circles, that leads to abject poverty because you can't afford to, and so really your family look like the poster children literally for this type of living and that God is providing this, this path. Um, yeah, I, I think it is weird. And it does go to maybe that testimony that certainly my grandparents never chose. Like no one objectively sure. is like, let's aspire to having children die. Like no, nobody, no, no, no. nobody. Right. Um, and yet how do you make sense of tragedy of, what objectively seems like blessing divine um, providence yeah, yeah. favor or providing and you know i was told stories by my grandparents about times when like they they had three adults 10 year gap and then their they became christians their worldview changed and they came to believe that um you know if god wanted to bless them with more children that should be in his hands and they had six more kids so i had um, 
an aunt that was around my age and an uncle that was six weeks old who had died in this accident. Mm. So there was starting to be, you know, I had an uncle yeah. younger than me and the generation start to, you know, my mother was pregnant at the same time as her mother-in-law and, you know, um, and when those children were, were taken away, it changed everything. Um, but stories of them when they did have a bunch of kids and like, what, what's going to happen? And someone, for like, I think Thanksgiving, and it's it's almost like legendary. I'm not even sure this literally <laughs> happened, but I just remember right. the story of there was no food. And literally then neighbors or someone came in and brought food and it was so much that it broke the table. You know, and, and the lesson being God will provide. Sure. You have to yeah. trust him by having the children, <laughs> by right. doing the thing. And like, look, it's almost like God gave us these kids. Mm -hmm. God has to make it all work. Um, yeah. And so you have these lessons that, do kind of reflect poverty or, or hardship. And then, but we were literally now living with millions of dollars. And also as a child, that doesn't make sense to you, right? I'm talking about the sense of Narnia, but I didn't yeah. really under, I can't grasp what a million dollars is and what You that just means. see that life has changed drastically. Yeah. And um, it's something interesting, like on the religious side, because you're, again, you're living and seeing inconsistency, you know, for lack, I mean, and that's the understatement of, in a, the decade, like you're seeing For this sure. inconsistency of what's being taught, but also, you know, you mentioned like, there's still all these whys in the book you mentioned being, you know, 16 and you're terrified of your own body that you don't understand, which is a very common purity culture, lack mm -hmm. of education approach. Your father who is representative of God in your life is acting in increasingly scary ways. like. Mm -hmm. For you at that time, where do you turn? Because I have to imagine that's tainting how you view any kind of spiritual outlet or view. Your mother's not in a position of real authority in the home. Like, was it just, I'm going to go into myself and retreat? Is it finding siblings? Like, where I are you at that. at that point? I talk about it in the book. And obviously, when you're summarizing, sometimes day to day, <laughs> sure. we have different ways of making sense of things. So. Right you lose detail when you zoom out. Um, but, you know, I referenced being around nine and having a different physical experience of abuse and that kind of shifting things internally and being like, how do I avoid being around dad? Um, and then him changing his um, kind of strategy, right? And, and then feeling like, well, it's kind of a deal I have to make in my head. Um, mm -hmm. I can't get away from it. I'm not going to have the support of my mother and or mother can't give me support. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and yeah, understanding that she didn't really have authority within her house. Um, and I would say the other thing there is we're now attending a independent Bible church. Um, my grandfather's church was an independent Baptist church, as far as I understand. Not that I ever sat down and asked <laughs> the clarifying questions at eight. Uh, again, you experienced um, it, but don't have right, words Baptist for it. Baptist church, sure. and as far as I know, it was independent. And then we moved to Tennessee and joined a church that, to me, immediately felt like an extension of the same. It wasn't like, whoa, the music's so different. Or, whoa, the teachings are so different. It was, no. we're still talking about John MacArthur. We're still talking, you know, I'm hearing the same names. I'm hearing the same teachings, basically. Um, but I am paying attention in a way at even eight, nine, 10, that I wasn't at five, six, seven. Right. right. Um, and, um, this man is not my grandfather, but it is another man, <laughs> white around the same age, you know, so right. there's a continuation of, you know, no one was ever saying that my grandfather was God. It was an analogy. So sure. here's a continuation of that. And, you know, you have these teachings about purity, about morals, about ethic, you know, the core of like right and wrong and starting to understand, oh, this is definitely wrong. Mm -hmm. And, but also very quickly having, because we were, because of the way I think my father approached um, how we were supposed to be taught. Like we were, I, I read very early. So I literally was reading scripture very, very young. And we were supposed to read the entire Bible. Like, you know, I was not 15 and had never read the Bible cover to cover. I had right. done that maybe multiple times at that point. I think I've probably only done it a handful of times. But um, I talk about in the book the moment where you realize we've heard Noah. We've heard David. <laughs> we didn't hear all of the David story. 
Yeah, right. right. And so I'm starting to go, okay, 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 okay. I haven't said anything. I haven't asked for help. I haven't, you know, it's still just keep it quiet. Try to make sense of it in your mind. Yeah. But I'm realizing that the story that I heard about David includes something that's a lot closer to, or let's let's go to an even simpler one, Latin's daughters, <laughs> right? So it's right. like sexual misconduct that involves daughters, fathers, like really weird. No one ever acknowledged that there was stuff like that in the Bible. And so I'm kind of watching all the adults in my circle, like literally every Christian that is picking up this book every day in church or in their homes is literally not talking about this. Mm -hmm. So when people talk about where did, you know, why didn't you speak up? There's so many answers to that. <laughs> yeah. Eight that that's a question we still ask. Well, but one of the specific answers is like, you're shown every day by every Christian around you that this exists and we do not talk about it. Yeah. I, I love that you say <laughs> that. And it's, it's one of the things listening to you on other shows that when you hear that question come up, why didn't you? Mm -hmm. I th most times hosts are legitimately going, I don't understand because this is so clear. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things that anybody listening to this show is going, of course you didn't speak up because there's no vocabulary for it. There's no understanding of even what what is sex. There's no understanding of what is, and your God figure is your pastor and your father. And so if you're getting a distorted view from that, like, I don't think people really understand what a bubble that is, <laughs> like, and how, yeah. how difficult it is to break through that, you know? And, and then yeah. on top of that, in your story, like, as things keep building up, where now you have the outside world that has opinions on you, and they're leaving comments on things and making statements like, where do you go to process that? you it's 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 such a it's like a bubble that's on display <laughs> so you're literally in this like snow globe kind of trying to like look the part while also figuring out what your part even is like i mean that's yes that definitely got really really weird towards <laughs> the end and i think that was the thing that my body could no longer sustain my mind yeah. could no longer sustain that um and you know seeing the gap between you were referencing um Another word is hypocrisy, right? When you say one thing and you do another right. thing, there's the conflict there. And so realizing, hey, the minute I'm starting to be able to take on right and wrong, realizing there's wrong, we don't talk about it, it's covered up, <laughs> is it my fault? You know, there's all this shame, literally realizing not, oh, this is a bad thing. It's a bad thing that I've been a part of for years. Yeah. You know, that's that's a heavy load. There's the conflict between what my father literally specifically is professing to believe and teach. And then he's doing some things that at least conflict with that. We don't talk about it. So it's not like he's clearly saying sexually touching your daughters is wrong. I'm doing it. Like it wouldn't get that specific, but you know that what's happening over here cannot be called pure. Right. Right. It cannot be it's not compatible good. with it that teaching. It yeah. Cannot, yeah. Right. So, you know, even if it's being avoided, you still know it's wrong, but how do you talk about it if nobody talks about it? What are the steps to changing it? Um, and there were some things that did unfold over the years, you know, it being talked about, it being covered up, it being, you know. Um, but eventually the there were so many other hypocrisies and conflicts, right? And the idea that we would present ourselves one way to all of our friends and then the way that dad would talk about them behind their back and the way that we would present ourselves all the way up to being on TV versus what really happened, yeah. you know, behind closed doors and getting in trouble for doing anything that would break that outward testimony. Cause the weird thing is, yeah. is all still being framed this way is kind of like weirdly. It's one thing for a grandparent, um, a preacher, a uh, missionary, right? People that are maybe actually doing some, like their career is related yeah. to religion or they're, you know, they're so forward with their religion. And we were going further and further from that. We were no longer going to church. We had this home church. Like yeah. there's a lot of Bible. So a lot of God says a lot of that, but it was just less and less the way other people participated in being Christian. And yet when needed, it was, well, God's will. It's God's the brand said. at that point yeah. where to it's a point great. Of like, why are we doing TV? Well, it's God's will. 
Sure. And it's like, really, or is it just dad's will? <laughs> yeah. And that line gets blurred more and more, you know, as you go. Yeah. And I think it- one of the struggles that I find is understanding the fallacy of me as a child really overlapping the image of God with my dad. Mm-hmm. But how are you supposed to blame the child when literally that's the word that the Bible itself uses? And it's the analogy that all of the adults really are making. And so I've come to the point of like, stop blaming my seven-year-old self and even my 20-year-old self and even my 30-year-old self. I am not crazy. You told me this, you know? And like the antidote and the thing that people respond with is like, well, you should never, you should never let a fallen human being, everybody's sinful. You you should never think of your dad as God. You should never expect a human fallen being you know, they aren't God. And it kind of turns into, you aren't God. Who are you to question God? And I'm like, but literally the way that you structured this whole thing. Right. It's built on that. that. Do yeah. not gaslight me. <laughs> that was not, that is what happened, you know? Yeah. And like, I get it now. I get it, you know, but children. But you had to find that truth outside of that. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, no. I, I, I love that you're saying, no. and again, it's something that. <laughs> It's something that one Christian should understand this who grew up in similar environments, but then it's from the time you're taught one plus one is two, the sky is blue and heaven, hell, God, like you're getting all of this crammed into you and programmed into you from day one. And if you're getting bad code input (laughs) into your, into yourself, like it's going like at that point, it's like how much responsibility, um, you know, you were on Sarah Nippy's show a little bit culty and like um, Sarah always talks about like the bounded choice. It's like, yes, you freely chose to do something, but was it a free choice? <laughs> like you. Well, it's yeah, such you- an extreme ridiculous example, but in, in my book, the only extended passage that has that's in quotes, that's like direct dialogue because it's hard in a memoir to really feel okay with representing long sections of like, if I don't have a recording, if I don't have objective proof that this is what was said, Mm -hmm. memories can be faulty, memories can, you know, and so like really trying to be truthful, there's not a lot of dialogue, but there's this section that I actually have video of and it's, it's even edited down, like I didn't include all of it, but everything that's in this section was literally said and it's this talk about bounded choice, it's you know, I'm in my early 20s. I'm trying to figure out how to leave. And I'm so chained up, like in my mind, <laughs> like um, just trying to get the gall to say, I deserve not to be in literal danger every day <laughs> around yeah. my user every day. Um, and my dad is doing this thing of like, who's your master? You know, is it God or Satan? There's only two. And creating this idea of like, it's like an interrogation where it, feels like the most dramatic inquisition in the entire world. And it's my family sitting in a room upstairs demanding that of me. And like everything's on the line, my soul, my family, my testimony, my like what, where I'm going to be at the end of the day, literally sleeping, like, where will I go? And, you know, it just creates this, this bubble, this world that is so hard to describe and articulate and even face the minute that you're not in it. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like it's like living on a different planet where yeah. we take things like gravity for granted, right? And it's hard to think about what our day-to-day life would be like without gravity, <laughs> right? And it's like that. It's like no, no, in that world, the rules were just different. There was this yeah. gravity that we don't have here, <laughs> but it was there. And everything had to be had to be ruled by it. And I think one of the other things that's important to look at is, you know, there's a loss of vocabulary, there's the teachings you've been given and stuff. And so for me, realizing the amount of abuse, rape, genocide, all sorts of things that were in the Bible, but were never phrased that way, were literally turned into cute little kid stories sometimes. That was a weird one. And then the next one was reading the stories where you look at God in the story. And so I had the experience of, hey, this doesn't seem right. This seems hypocritical. This seems, no. how can you be love and be vengeful? How can you be pure, but also do these things? And the answer is like, 
it's above your pay grade. Yeah. Don't question my authority. Lean and, not on your own understanding or right, God works in mysterious see, ways. To start seeing a God that really looked quite a bit like that in the Bible where, oh no, I want you to kill every man, woman, and child and the animals and going, Hey, how is this good? And being told he's God, you can't question him. Mm. You know, there's all these rules, but God gets to break them. He made the rules. So he's not even breaking them when he chooses to do something different. You're a human. You don't understand. And to have that same sort of logic applied to you as a child, like, Hey dad, you're not wow. doing what you told all of us to do, what you say to others to do, but I'm the dad, but I, you know, it's, mm. it's, I'm the authority and this image of the patriarchal authority that gets to make and break his own rules. And if you are trying to say that's objectively not right, then just be told you literally don't understand you little worm of a being, <laughs> you know, and to see parts of the Bible and the biblical God kind of mirror that and then to go, oh shit, what do I, how do I, Hmm. Here I am questioning God, you know? Yeah. It's a weird hmm. place to be in. Yeah. <laughs> no. And I, I, again, I think it's something that people listen to the show are walking through and it is, it is, it's hard to grapple with like, is there something that truly is beyond my understanding that will make sense at some eternal moment? Is it something that is a figure created by men like your dad who needed a, a deity to back up what they were doing, who your dad was in your mind and in the, the eyes of your family and God, the, like I said, that line is so blurred by the end of that part of your story. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I interviewed a, I interviewed a woman who like knew Harvey Weinstein in the entertainment industry. Oh, wow. And she mentioned when he was arrested, it felt like seeing God in handcuffs. And that's stuck with me ever since the conversation. And um, she said it was the most powerful being I could ever imagine in handcuffs. And I have to imagine for you, seeing your dad in handcuffs was like seeing the most powerful deity that you'd ever known. That's an interesting, that's a really interesting image. So yeah, I'm just sitting with that too. <laughs> I, you know, after my intro and some disclaimers and some background. Um, I start my book with the moment of going to my dad's sentencing. Um, he did take a, he pled guilty. Um, but up until the moment that he had to do so, I was completely not disbelief, but just like, okay, I'll watch gravity get reversed. Yeah. When, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, Somehow this is not like, real. Yeah, It has not happened up until this moment. It has never happened up until this moment. I'm not saying it's not possible, but it will change everything if this happens. Um, and the stakes were so high. You know, I bring up the analogy of, for example, like <clears throat> if you know Lord of the Rings, right? You've read the books, you've watched the movies. Other than the first time you either watched the movie or read the book, Nobody knows it's the ring of power, right? Gandalf suspects it. He has to go check. Yeah. And at that moment, everything changes, right? But once you know that, you don't forget and re-remember each time. It's something that you have, and it kind of shifts a little bit the way you watch the beginning of that story unfold. And for me, it's so interesting to try to keep reminding people, like... <laughs> This could have gone so different at so mm -hmm. many different points in the right. story. Like it's this spider web of just completely different outcomes. And I am this, you know, such in the minority that the person that abused me is not able to find me, come get yeah. me, come, come try to be a part of my life. And that is not the norm. Yeah. Um, you have the justice system for better or for worse, what, what it can do, it's done for me, right? It cannot give me the debt I should have had. It cannot undo all of that, but it can say this did happen. We're trying to 
have some sort of justice. And whether you think incarceration is good or bad, you know, I have this weird thing of looking at the way discipline and punishment is taught even to children and then to adults and being like, that person did not change their mind. That person is not sorry for what they did. What is punishing them really doing here? You know, but I do think like for people that have shown that they will, nobody has a crystal ball. No one here is claiming to be God, but like this per- needs to be removed from, from society. Yeah. It's the only way. Other They're truly a danger to society. Right. Yeah. Truly. Um, and I think my dad falls in that category. And so many people who do fall in that category still are not even seeing that hmm. punishment, you know, that, that yeah, um, right. victims aren't getting that protection. They're getting two months of probation and back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Literally. And so for me, just remembering things like there was no guarantee that that was going to happen. Yeah. Dad could literally, like, could he bring himself to say, he essentially just had to say the word guilty. Um, and I just was like, I have to base, I have to stay rooted in reality, not what I want to be happening, not what could happen. And that's what I did for many years is just pretend he's a good dad. Yeah. Just go about life as if things are fine, you know, and not living in reality. So it was like, look, to some degree with this, I will believe it when I see it because it literally won't happen unless he can admit this. Um, and up until then, reality told me that was not. Yeah. Somehow possible. he's walking out of here and. Yeah. And uh, if he had not pled, it would have gone to trial and it's very hard to. It can be literal reality and it can be very hard to prove in a court of law. And, uh, you know, it was unsure whether it would be me versus my dad and a sense all of my family and no one coming across the line and kind of backing him up or whether people were going, anyone else in the family was going to corroborate anything. And um, it's a terrible part of the way things went down, but there was eventual evidence, you know, actual evidence that it was not just... I said versus my dad said and everybody else, or even us saying versus my dad, it it did become, okay, this man is lying about things we can prove did happen. And that's what really changed the investigation itself. But um, yeah, I mean, just getting back to your question of just, and that amazing striking image of you know, yeah, the most powerful person. And I, I kind of, I, I do articulate that in the book and this idea that he was king. Yeah. He was the voice of God for so many years. He said, jump. I said, how high? You know, he said, put a smile on your face. And I did after he hit it, you know, like that kind of thing. And, um, and the weird thing is, for all the times that I, that he seemed so strong and absolutely untouchable and all of these things, all it took was like one word to crumble all of that. Mm. And that's the weird thing is like one second of the truth brought all of that down, wow. um, which shifts your perspective on, you know, just how small this person really is, mm. you know, and he just really seemed like a, like a shell of a man. It was so weird because I hadn't seen him in a long time. The times I had seen him were so bad right before I left. Just the worst time of my entire life. It was not the stuff from childhood. It was what happened to me when I was in my early 20s. That mm-hmm. was like, I will be healing from for the rest of my life. Um, or all of it together. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, that was quite a moment. And I did feel I wanted to be there to to see that. Hmm. Well, I I can't express enough how much of a disservice I feel we're doing like covering this in a short period of time. Um, And for, again, for anybody listening, like your story from cover to cover is something I think everybody who's listening to this show should read and hear. And honestly, any chance to hear you speak about your story, I think there's so much value and help I think that can be taken from that. Um, but I want to ask, we've we've gone and given a 10,000 foot view of your story. You've gone into great detail within your book. I want to talk about just processing all of this because once you see him become the shell of a man, you see this 
facade crumble, you've got the opportunity to rebuild and to, you know, uh, to claim your story versus the brand story that was created and this web of lies that was built. Um, but that's not been without pushback. Um, you mentioned on a on a podcast recently, you know, you've had religious folks that have said like your book is too explicit. And you you mentioned in that conversation, um, you know, you're telling me that my story is too painful for you to hear, but like I had to live it. So it's my right to share it. Like, what's it been like again? You were in this kind of cultish bubble of abuse publicly. Now you're kind of reconstructing your life publicly and you've got input there that you're thinking about. Like, what does that look like for you currently? What does that, have you thought about re- retreating and being in, I guess, isolation from the public sphere to work through it? Do you feel uh, like upset when people do take it as like an offense to them that you would share in whatever format you want to share? Like, Talk to me about just that kind of journey of rediscovering or discovering for the first time. I shouldn't even say rediscovering, discovering truly who you are and what you desire for your life. Sure. I, you know, am able to be most days really in a space of joy and gratitude based on the fact that I am now living so many things that I thought were impossible. Um you know, that gravity reversed and the thing that had never happened happened. And all of a sudden that meant anything could kind of happen. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of, and, and my reality was finally validated and accepted, not by everyone, definitely still challenged. But the point was there had been no acknowledgement of it. No, you know, I, all I had to do was really get to the place where I could say everyone else could not believe me, but I know this happened. And, um, that was a huge shift for me, um, and, and changed everything. And, you know, when someone, I definitely am human. People have different personalities, different ways of taking in. I don't, there's sometimes I go, I just don't even need to listen to what that person's going to say. Cause it's not helpful for me at all. Sure. Um, you know, definitely, for example, book reviews, I see a lot of those. Um, mm-hmm. And so many have been um, kind of rewarding and encouraging and validating, not all. Um, but when, say, criticism comes maybe in that format, um, when you've had someone that you really love that wasn't there for you, doubt you, someone that I don't even know, <laughs> it doesn't hit the same way. Right. Yeah. It's not the deepest wound. Right. So, I mean, that's a little bit of how I feel um, with just kind of processing the reception to say my book um, and being clear about who, who, whose opinion really matters most to me <laughs> and making sure that that isn't too wide of a, too big of a pool. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that's sustainable or healthy, f- mentally healthy for me. Okay. Um, And I think, too, there's a sense of we know something's wrong with the relationship if we have this feeling of um, who, if you really knew who I was, you wouldn't be friends with me anymore. Or, you know, our relationship is contingent on me participating in some storyline or lifestyle or something. And I, I do feel for me there's still still a lot to be kind of determined and, um, you know, navigated because I am in a weird place where for some people I know, cause I, they've told me, <laughs> um, it's not necessarily just conjecture, but, oh, how sad that you have fallen away. Um, and for other mm-hmm. people, um, they even read in more common beliefs. Like they, they believe we believe more in common than we really do. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, I'm in a weird space where, um, I'm not saying I'm not a Christian full stop. I know I'm definitely not what I was raised to be, to believe a Christian was, um, still trying to navigate that. And, you know, how you get this weird sense of, sometimes I've debated, like, do I have to like on the record, <laughs> right. Change of opinion and change of belief. Definitely not. If I'm still not sure exactly where I land, the only thing I can really say is great. 
update is, we don't know. Um, but there is this weird kind of reckoning and feeling with, I think, if evangelicalism has been a part of your life at all, you know, this idea of testimony and this idea yeah. of at some point you're supposed to be publicly declaring what it is and your story and your gifts and everything is supposed to point back to God. And like you um, kind of have this obligation to navigate that publicly, um, even separate from possibly reality show and, and like publicity in your background, which I do have. Um, so that's, that's an interesting one. I'm not sure exactly where that's all going. Um, and I think for me, one of the places that I'm in right now is just saying like, I don't owe this to anyone. Yeah. I would have been told growing up that I do, but I do not. I, right. you know, just a human being trying to be healthy, trying to be honest with oneself, trying to live. And I'm very lucky to have the chance to do that. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a big thing to commit to and then follow through on sharing such personal stuff, you know, right. and I have not regretted that. It has been absolutely worth that. Um, it's brought challenges I didn't, hadn't imagined before, um, even though I spent lots of time <laughs> thinking about the possible ways it could go. And, yeah. um, you know, now we're navigating from a new foundation. You know, I think I've come a long way and a lot has happened in like the last two years. Yeah. Um, and I'm in maybe just a season of, um, being in a process that I recognize from, you know, the year before I put out the book, like as you start writing new things, it's like, all right, what is it? What exactly is happening here? You know, is yeah. this the beginning of more music, more writing? Um, but it's all and a lived story unfolding day to day as well. Yeah. Well, and that's what's so interesting about talking about it because I, I've noticed, and I'm sure you've noticed the same thing, there's a lot of people who have not done the work, who just say things that they feel they're supposed to say. And they have these pithy, like, well, obviously there's a purpose for this, <laughs> or they say whatever. And, you know, and doing this podcast, you know, there's things I've had to share about my personal life. That I never expected to share like things I'm working through because you're talking for an hour and 20 minutes, you know, every week you start getting into the, in, in, when you say a pithy statement and you've got a guest on who says, well, no, here's my experience. And it contradicted, like you have to start working through those things. And I have to imagine like writing a book or writing music or any of those things is kind of like forcing you to ask questions that are uncomfortable to ask <laughs> and making you go, I say this thing about God, but it's, again, it's, kind of in diametrically opposed to this experience that I had. So what does that mean? And the unfortunate thing I think that you kind of are hitting on, and I've heard you hit on in other conversations is like, you have all these people with strong opinions about how you're doing the work when they've not done that work themselves. <laughs> they have had, you know. Well, aren't there huge swaths of our, I mean, literally, a silly, a sillier version of this is the person who's sitting in the armchair who's never played a sport a day in their right. life. Yeah. Being like, I can't believe that person didn't hit the whatever. Um, you know, and so I think for a while now, we have, and like spectatorship has been around a very long time. Mm -hmm. but, you know, maybe in our most recent through screens, through technology, through, you know, just how much of our daily life we are spectating. Um, and being encouraged to, you know, the guy that was watching the game couldn't really actually talk to that player. But yeah. like now, now, now you can slide in the DMs and to, say, hey, you tweet suck. To <laughs> hey, and so we've invited the people that are spectators to now also be critics and commentators. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's been said and then used like Brittany Brown has used um the whole like man in the arena speech um the Roosevelt speech of just saying like you know I think that's another thing that helps me is someone you know through technology even if I totally didn't invite 
them other than speaking my story, that is a type of invitation, at least in this day and age, to, hey, respond. Tell me what you think about my story, if you will. You have the tools to do so. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for someone to just launch in and say something, you know, I I do feel like one of my steps is I'm in the arena. Like, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. I have no idea what's going on in your life. This may be more about you than it is about me. Like, yeah. we just don't it's so hard to hold space for just how much our experiences are informing how we see the world and yeah. that's me saying specifically i very much understand that my experience with my dad with what was told to me by not just my dad all the other preachers <laughs> pretty much every other man that was told to me to be an authority has turned out to not be a healthy source of anything. So it's been this very repetitive cycle, which I think a lot of people are going through right now. Yeah. Um, but just to say, you know, I can't. And here, here's the thing: if if I do have a criticism for myself for someone else, the best thing that I want to always be able to say is, "You could be totally right. I am doing the best that I can, and I'm I'm doing my work. And there's so much to get to." I am genuinely sorry I haven't gotten to all of it yet, but I'm also not sitting on my butt, not doing yeah. my work. We have a capacity. There's only so much we can deal with. And for me, having about 25 years of buildup of not being processed, not being validated, all of this back, you know, backlogged work, for me, I couldn't just take on this responsibility of, well, I got to get it all done today. It's like, yeah. I have to walk this road for the rest of my life day yeah. to day. There is and, no done. <laughs> right. There it's, is no done there. And it's not even like we're going to stand in one place and do all this backlog work. It's like, as we're doing that, we are still experiencing, encountering and making sense. This life is being lived even as we're trying to process it. Um, yeah. And, you know, to your point you kind of referenced you know your experience with this podcast and talking and things coming up and like for me uh, having done some of that done interviews and stuff and have plans I would really love to do more in the podcast space even myself um I plan to write more make more music yeah. um you know for me the only way that all is healthy for me at this point if it's a genuine burst and so like there is this expectation or question or at least opportunity of, do you want to write another book? Right. But I'm kind of like, it isn't real for me unless I'm literally not thinking of that. Right. Because if I start thinking about making a product, how are you supposed to like, at least a memoir? I mean, if it's a novel, it's one thing, but I don't think you can go through life. You could literally just start conjuring things to make up to write. And that's what, that's yeah. what reality TV feels like is yeah. like, let's, Make a plan and then do it and then like what's the most compelling angle on this? You're yeah. somehow com making your 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 like script writing your life and then doing it and like that just it immediately feels so disingenuous. So like the reason why I can't tell you what any future memoir would be about is because guess what? I'm still living it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and I'm still working on it. Yeah. And um there is pressure a lot of times I think we get from society in this day and age to what's the brand, what's the angle, what's the what's the pitchable, sellable thing. Right. And to try to maintain your humanness and your real life and so that you can be realistic, be healthy, be integrated and constantly at least be going towards those things. It's a it's a struggle to try to to maintain that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. It's doing that again in real time is is <laughs> a hefty task, you know, and it's, it is, and people do, they want your take. What's your take on this now? What's your take? And, you know, what's your thought on this election? What's your thought on this book? What's your thought on that? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, um, and that's where I do. I'm like, you know, the thing that I'm working on is a lot more close to home than that. And I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. how can we really know if someone's asking me to throw out an opinion for something that's I can never really touch. I don't know this person. I don't know. You know, yeah. there's so much higher priorities for me day yeah. to day. Like the stakes are so high and things that are so much more personal to me that no one else can do that work. 
Like right. let someone else who's more involved, you know, yeah. uh, tune in on some of those things. Yeah. Um, but for me to really guard and prioritize and fight for the things that I need, because no one else is going to do them for me. Right. Yeah. That brings it back to home and gives me a good anchor um, when it feels like there's so much going on around me. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Well, I, I, I mean, I could talk to you for another three hours, um, but I'm sure, I'm sure you've got a heart out somewhere in those three hours, but I, I really do appreciate you doing this. I hope it's not the last time that we talk. Um, and you know, I appreciate you sharing your story because again, this could have been a personal assignment to yourself to work through these things. But again, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. It's, incredibly powerful. And I hope, I hope anybody listening will check it out. Um, it's, it's really important. I think for anybody who's been through these experiences, but also for someone trying to understand, like it is, it's a masterclass in understanding how these kind of things happen and how they can be like, there's so many places where you go, if someone had stepped in here, it could have changed the trajectory. And I hope in the future we see that happen in, in other stories. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much for reading. Thank you for, you know, you have the people that listen to your show and have kind of invested in your story and your work. Um, And I definitely think there's a lot of overlap there. Um, And so I appreciate that. I feel like, look, there's a lot of people that are not interested in listening to this type of story. And then I remember and still am the person that will seek out those things. And when you come across people who are doing this work and it's like, okay, give me your top 10 recommendations because I know this is going to be so tailored. And, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, I've read that one. Then you can discuss it. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it does, you know, I'm aware that there could be people that, you know, the reason why they're been tuning in and, and listening to your story, that there would be a lot of the same reasons. Um, and uh, again, one of the reasons for me to even share what it, what it is that I've gone through and what I've written um, to to share publicly. And um, yeah, I I definitely think when I get to people that like I really do feel like we could have ten more conversations. And yeah. there's no reason why we can't. And <laughs> right. you know, podcasting is an interesting thing where you're having the conversation, but then you're also sharing it. So it's a little bit different type of conversation because you are keeping that in mind but i think the best conversations are just about um you know whatever it is that we want to know or want to share or talk about so um yeah i just appreciate the time yeah well we have nine more conversations and we're we're locked in (laughs) i'm excited for no and i do it is fun it is really funny like i do catch myself where i'll be like oh i had them on or we had this conversation and then i'm like there's so many people I've talked to where I'm like, we could have like six more conversations just like this. That would be so helpful. And again, like what I appreciate about you is, is um, you know, the conversation we just had, I feel like is the conversation we would have with no mics. <laughs> if we, you know, if that's we met it. somewhere, like it, it would be yeah. this conversation, you know, which is cool. And that's a goal that I would have for, um, you know, interviews and, and, um, just in real life, I think I can always try to be a better listener and try yeah. to be more succinct. Um, and it has been interesting doing more interviews where um, in on the whole, I do need to balance out. Um, it's a privilege and an honor and a responsibility, I think, to um, sometimes be sharing my story. And then I'm like, well, I need to be able to ask people, what's what about your story? You know, and <laughs> right. not have my story always be the centered thing in an interaction. So I think that's where feeling drawn to, um, you know, it's one thing to be, I know you've, you've done both things. You've been interviewed and you interview yeah. and I, think you're, um, I definitely take notes of people that, uh, you know, Oh, what a calming voice or what good questions. And, mm-hmm. you know, just want to, that's definitely an area that I can think can grow in and explore maybe. So um, anyway, thank you yeah. for the, time today and just your interest and i think that um straight up sexual abuse is always always makes the conversation hard yeah and um there is a sense of healing that comes from being able to say it being able to have it be on the table and it not wreck everything (laughs) in the process 
Right. Yeah. That's a, that's, that's hard work. So thank you for participating and leaning in to that, yeah. uh, that you do. So, yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, again, if you're listening, be sure to pick up a copy of unspeakable. It's a really phenomenal book goes far in depth. And I will say too, just for those that are listening, it is a heavy, heavy book. If you're listening to the show, you're not a stranger to heavy topics. Um, but one of the things I do appreciate is there's literally in the beginning of the book, it tells you where the heaviest things are. So if you wanted to kind of cherry pick in some ways and avoid some of the more triggering or things that you may not be ready to handle, there are ways to read through the book that can, I I think again, for anybody, I think it's approachable. Yeah. And I, I just made the choice. Um, there is a debate to whether, whether to even include the specifics of any full one instance Mm -hmm. of abuse of sexual abuse. And I made the choice to include two out of, and and I've had people say, but it's so explicit. It's so much. Why did you say everything that you said? And I'm like, it is such a small little fraction of everything that actually happened. So there's a lot of restraint being used here and intentionality and, and carefulness and all of that. But, um, I also remember, um, I can empathize with my own younger self and how overwhelming it was to actually have someone say the real thing and not sugarcoat it or, or use an analogy or, or summarize or avoid or look away and to really look in the eye. Um, and so I felt that was important, but also to try to kind of, it's not quite choose your own adventure. That sounds very flippant, but you know, you, you can at, um, sure. hopefully do what's right for yeah. you. It doesn't, those aren't the only things that are hard to read though in the book. A lot right. of it right. Hard. Yeah. I, um, yeah, but it gives people, it's accessible to anybody at any stage in their, in their journey. I and think. I think it's a, to me, I feel the moral obligation when I do get the chance to warn people. Obviously, the book and the audiobook itself has that in there. But I remember panicking kind of right before the book came out. Like, what if people think this is like a fun beach read? And it literally is not. I mean, it, the title, all of those choices are yeah. part, <laughs> part yeah. of telling that story. But I was like, I don't feel good about someone just blindly <laughs> Yeah, It's this. certainly not a fun beach read, but it's an important read. <laughs> um, and I, I hope people will check it out. And I hope, like I said, I hope again to speak in the future and yeah. uh, have you back on the show. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much, Eric. I appreciate it.